Is there evidence that a worldwide flood really happened? Has anybody really seen Noah's Ark? Will the creation be restored to its original glory? There is much to consider in this final hour. Welcome to the sixth and final segment of Creation in Symphony. We've examined the creation pretty intricately from day number one all the way through the time of the pre-flood world. Our task in this final segment is to see this world torn up, digress, and finally a restoration of the entire creation for the eternal ages. Let's see if we can do that. It is obvious that our world today is not in the same condition as described in the biblical record or as indicated in the marvelous, primordial, primitive, ancient, utopian legends around the world. It appears that something dramatic has happened to change all of this. It appears that we have less oxygen so that anaerobic bacteria can thrive. It appears that staph infections, which are anaerobic infections, hold the potential to destroy civilization. It appears that the Earth's geomagnetic field has lost its moment or energy or intensity to such a degree that biological systems are now compromised in the intercellular communication. We're in trouble. One of the leading scientific journals recently published an article stating that within the next 2,000 years we will lose all of the Earth's magnetic field. Now that could send shockwaves of alarm in scholastic chairs around the world because, as I told you in earlier sessions, all biological systems have intercellular communication and receive their energy from the Earth's magnetic field. All of that information is either chemical, chemically transported and transferred, or electromagnetically transferred. So we're in a decadent context. What caused it? There was a cataclysm in the past. In the creation model, there was a major cataclysm at the time of Noah's flood and a separate cataclysm in the days of Peleg. Let's see if I can give you the consummation of this model to put it all together and hopefully give you an academic basis for recognizing this as truth. Did Noah's flood really occur? Did um, the ark really rest on Mount Ararat? Dr. Melville B. Grosnever, late editor of National Geographic magazine, stated that if the ark of Noah is ever discovered, it would be the greatest archaeological find in human history, the greatest event since the resurrection of Christ, and it would alter all the currents of scientific thought. Now let's major on that concept for a moment. It would alter all the currents of scientific thought. There was a time when you and I recognized science as fact. In fact, it's supposed to be knowledge. But currently, our science departments are disciplines with a basic mindset approaching all the data. It would take something like really discovering Noah's Ark, bringing back components of that Ark, being able to verify it regularly to alter those currents. But I think Dr. Grosvenor aptly stated and correctly stated that it holds the potential to change the currents of modern scientific thinking. There was a time in the not too distant past when a global flood was recognized as being a reality in geologic circles. Benjamin Silliman, head of geology at Yale in the 1800s, wrote, Respecting the deluge, the flood, the worldwide flood, there can be but one opinion. Geology fully confirms the scriptural history of the event. Whales, sharks, crocodiles, amphibians, the mammoths, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, hyenas, tigers, deer, Horses, bovine families, are found buried together in diluvium at a greater or lesser depth, and in most instances under circumstances indicating that they were buried by the same catastrophe which destroyed them, namely a sudden and violent deluge. I think he was right on line. 
Evolutionist Richard Carrington, in Story of the Earth, a secular publication, admitted, of the many kinds of animals inhabiting the earth at the time, vast numbers were swept completely away. Not only individuals, but whole races were destroyed. An extermination overtook the animals of the land, sea, and air with equal indifference. When the Holocaust was over, the whole aspect of life on earth had changed. Was there such a global catastrophe? Leading scholars have admitted, such as Dr. James Trofel, George Mason University, that the dinosaurs were struck by a catastrophe. He wrote that they present this kind of pattern. Suddenly their fossils disappear from the rocks. And when I say suddenly, he wrote, I mean a time that could be as long as 100,000 years or as short as a weekend. We can't tell the difference. At the same time, the dinosaurs disappeared. All the other species we talked about, from ocean plankton to some flowering plants, disappeared as well. Paleontologists term this sort of event in which many species disappear in the same time a mass extinction. And there have been mass extinctions, both at the time of the flood and in the days of Peleg. And this is recognized to one degree or another, even though the time frame and the terminology would vary, recognized as mass extinction by leading scholars. Dr. John R. Horner, in Digging for Dinosaurs, stated, Judging from the concentration of bones in various pits, there were over 30 million fossil fragments in that area, a single area. At a conservative estimate, we've discovered the tomb of 10,000 dinosaurs. There was a flood. This was no ordinary spring flood from one of the streams in the area, but a catastrophic inundation. That's our best explanation. It seems to make the most sense. And on the basis of it, we believe that this was a living, breathing group of dinosaurs destroyed in one catastrophic moment. Can we account for that moment in creation circles? Yes. It's accounted for primarily in the global flood. Now, there are various questions that come to mind when we talk of Noah's flood and the ark. First of all, uh, are others, other than the biblical record, are there other reportings of the same basic event? Yes. Dr. Joannes Rehm stated that among all traditions, there is none so general, so widespread on earth as the fact that the deluge is granted because of the basis of all myths, particularly nature myths, having a real basis in fact. And we have listed by Dr. Blick, Dr. Richard Blick, just an abbreviation of the areas where these flood legends have occurred. Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, South America, and the Pacific. We have the Armenians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Hebrews, the Indo-Aryans, the Japanese, the Kurnals, the Mongols, the Persians, the Phoenicians, the Pythicans, the Syrians, the Tartans, and others who have this basic concept in their literature, their history, and their legends. In Africa, Bergamal, Carthasians, Egyptians, Hottentots, Subanese. In Europe, the Druids, the Germans, the Greeks, the Gypsies, the Icelanders, the Laplanders, the Lithuanians, the Norse, the Romans, the Slavs, the Vogels, and the Welsh all talk about a global flood. In North America, the Algonquins, the Arapahoes, the Aztecs, the Cherokees, the Crees, the Eskimos, the Galoshes, the Kualas, the Mayans, the Mohicans, the Papagos, the Pimas, the Texri, etc., all talk about a flood in which all of mankind but a small group had been destroyed. In South America, the Curas, the Incas, the Mayuris, the Tanats, in the Pacific, the Bataks, the Fijians, the Hawaiians, the Melanesians, the Mechanesians, the Moronesians, the New Hebrides, and the South Polynesian Islands all refer to a global flood. I brought for your attention today, and for your consideration, a list taken from a very fine book by 
Paul Taylor. I think you'll want to get that book, Illustrated Origins book, and you're able to order that through the Creation Evidences Museum. He has listed here a composite of evidences <clears throat> showing that there was a global flood. I mention in brief the following. The existence of extremely large numbers of fossils. Hugh Miller wrote decades ago that the entire British Isles are underlain by billions of fish fossils. Not laid down by normal sedimentary deposits. But many of these have arched backs, distended gills, open mouths, as if trying to get oxygen, but they were caught with silt in their gills and destroyed by the billions in a cataclysmic, sedimentary context that would take a worldwide flood. In one of our excavations, Nova was filming over my shoulder as we removed the original matrix of rock, the overburden of rock, as we delicately excavated through the clay marl layers, we discovered for the first time in Cretaceous layering a lepidodendron. Now that's a plant that today gets 16, 18 inches tall, but in the fossil record got up to 120 feet tall. The lepidodendron that we excavated was 48 inches at the base, extremely broad, compressed, it still had the pods unique to that particular uh, fauna and a root extension all in the same compressed sedimentary deposit. Eight inches of that lateral root that had been washed in and the plant that had been washed in by fluid hydrology. Eight inches of the side extended into the rock layer beneath. The rest of the plant compressed, extended up through the marl into the next rock layer above. We call that a polystrate fossil. It extends between at least two layers, a tender plant. Now, according to evolutionary geology, there are probably two million years between those rock layers. But the facts indicate very clearly that there are only a few hours between those two rock layers. For that tender plant, before bacteria could destroy it, before scavengers could eat it, and some of the dinosaurs were herbivorous at that time, that tender plant was still intact. And it was embedded in one layer of rock. It extended up into the next layer of rock, and those two layers are cyclical. That is, they are laid down in series. Now, how extensive was the flood that washed that plant remain in. Those rocks extend from central Texas near Austin, 1,600 miles all the way to the eastern seaboard of the United States. They pick up again at the White Cliffs of Dover, pick up again in northern Ethiopia. We're talking about three separate continents involved in the sedimentary deposit of those rocks that contain that polystrate fossil. There's only one plausible explanation. It was a worldwide flood. And there's been only one global flood, and that was the flood of Noah's day. Back to the evidences printed here. The uh, extension or existence of extremely large numbers of fossils. Rapid fossilization is evidenced by preservation of delicate parts. In one of the earlier sessions, I showed you a fossilized human finger, delicate parts. I showed you a fossilized earthworm in the same context, delicate parts, before bacteria could begin to destroy the cellular structure, before scavengers could get to these remains that had been living. They were deposited and in the lithography, in the actual sedimentary process, they became fossils being completely encased very, very rapidly. That's what we're talking about here. Whale fossils. Near Long California in diatomaceous earth, they found an 80-foot baleen whale deposited in the sedimentary layers on its tail. In order to sweep a creature like that, 
to that vertical position. In order to sedimentarily encase that creature, we're talking about a global experience of catastrophic proportions. That's the evidence at hand. Polystrate fossils, like the one I mentioned a moment ago. Random order of fossils. You actually have the fossils just intermingling together, impacted all simultaneously. Let me illustrate. I brought for your perusal an actual photograph of one of these fossils, or a set of these fossils. Here is a fish. And he's distended, his gills are distended. That shows he's in some sort of catastrophe. Yet, impacted with him is a plant, and that plant has some of the chlorophyll still intact in its veins of the leaves. We're talking about immediate deposition, yet this is a sign Cretaceous age, averaging around 100 million years by evolutionary scenario. There is no way that could remain with the chlorophyll intact for a hundred million years. We're talking about these things being deposited very rapidly and together in random order. Now, let's address an issue. While the fossils are found in random order, there is a general tendency to find marine creatures like trilobites at the bottom, a general tendency, even though, even though there are many anomalies and exceptions to this, but a general tendency to find plants and amphibians next, then to find uh, reptiles next, then to find mammals, and finally man. A general tendency. Of course, as you know, we have found human and dinosaur footprints in the very same area, which breaks the rule entirely. But there is a general tendency. Why? First, because of the hydrodynamic sorting. There is specific density and gravity to each life form. And those that are normally living near the ocean or near the waters have a specific density and gravity which would carry them and deposit them first. The dinosaurs were not afraid of water. This, by their choice, would mean that they would not be caught early but would be caught rather soon. Amphibians would be caught before that. Mammals have a reflex against water, so they would be caught next. Man not only has a reflex against water, but has the ingenious resource to build rafts and to get away from moving water to some degree. Thus, we have a general sorting context, ecological zonation, if you please, a general method by which the fossils are found from one layer to the next, to the next, to the next. However, there are so many exceptions to that, a flood is a far better explanation than evolutionary deposit over millions of years. Massive sedimentation. Some of the beds, delostrum beds and others, are one in two hundred feet thick as a single movement of sediment. Massive sedimentation. Chert beds, the same way. Conglomerates, where you find granites, gravels, and other materials having been pulverized, all thrown together. Then the global existence of massive amounts of gray, wacky sandstone. Massive precipitation of gypsum, common salt. Precipitation involves, of course, a sorting process. Fluid dynamic experience carried on by Emmy Clark and Henry Voss have actually taken various silts. I personally examined their experiments in their laboratory. They have taken mud and sand, red sand and white sand, and other materials, mixed them all together, circulated them in a huge flume vat, and then let them settle. And to their amazement, they settled dynamically in like products. There were striation layers of red sand, of white sand, of the organic material and the other material in systematic layering. Each was attracted to its own. So these experiments are very important. Massive volcanism showing a worldwide convulsion. Warmer global climate in the past. Actually, they have found 
under Antarctica and the Arctic as well, fossils that are marine, plant, and terra fossils, all indicating a warm global context in the past with no ice at the poles. Correlation of death dates by radiocarbon indicate there was a time approximately less than 5,000 years ago that correlate all of this together. Evidence of rapid deposition in the internal characteristics of strata sequences, all of these bolding together. Mountain uplifts after most sedimentation occurred. Underfit streams and rivers all showing drain off. Massive rapid erosion like the Grand Canyon. Existence of great plunge pools, existence of submarine canyons that are deeper than Mount Everest is high. Evidences from studies of smaller scale catastrophes like Mount St. Helens and Krakatoa. Flood legends around the world and the Genesis record itself. Well, we can see that something certainly did happen. Secular geophysicist recognize there was a time in the past in which Pangaea had all of the continents essentially together. Asia, Europe, North America, South America, Africa, Antarctica, all were together. Pangaea then ruptured, and we have a separation into Guandana land and Laurasia, Africa, and Antarctica. And then finally, a separation of all of that. The point is this, and is extremely important. There has been a separation of the continents and an enlargement of the globe. Let me repeat that. There's been a separation of the continents and an enlargement of the globe. Did the flood really happen? Is Noah's Ark really there? Let's talk about that for a few moments. Our team... led by Dr. Don Shockey, co-directed by myself and his secretary, Robert Summers, the triumphant, the advanced team. Our team has secured special permission from the Turkish government. And in 1990, we did, along with other assistants, 11 separate helicopter sortie expeditions around Mount Ararat. Is the Ark actually there? Well, first, what does the ark look like? Remember, Dr. Grosvenor stated that if the ark were ever discovered, it would be the most important of all archaeological discoveries of all time. Our team is trying to deflate any ego trip involved in the discovery of the ark. Our position is that it's already been discovered. Any work that we do is simply confirmation, or any work that any other scholastic-based expeditioners will do is simply confirmation. Is the ark really there? Well, let's see. The ark was a structure 300 cubits long, which would indicate a cubit being 20.6 inches long. Normally, we consider the ark to uh, have been, or the cubit to have been 18 inches long, but recent discoveries in the last decade have indicated that Actually, a cubit was a little longer. There was the royal cubit that ventured up to 16 uh, to 26 inches. The cubit was actually a changing modem of measurement. The uh, cubit was known to be either the length of the firstborn male son of the monarch or the length from his elbow to the tip of his index finger of the monarch himself. So recognizing that, the ark was actually approximately 500 feet long, 86 feet wide, and 52 feet high. It was not shaped like a canoe, as our normal uh, visionary drawings would illustrate it as being, but it was basically like a barge with beveled edges. The window was not a single window at the top, just a cubit by a cubit, even though it was a single window structure. The biblical record states that the window was to be finished a cubit above, above the entire ark. Eyewitness accounts indicate a long window structure 
open on the sides, long, narrow, thin, a cubit high, running essentially the length of the entire ark. Descriptions, 1943, when uh, Ed Davis claims to have seen the ark, and I believe he certainly did. Indications are that the ark has a keel. George Hagopian, in the early 1900s, claims that twice he was taken up to see the ark, and that the stern end of it had a series of steps built into the ark, and I believe his account as well. With that in mind, I want to show you some photographs taken at the Shockey site. And I deliberately and specifically call it and identify it as the Shockey site because Dr. Don Shockey, who is one of our consultants at the museum, but also heads Fiber Foundation for International Biblical Education and Research, Dr. Shockey received satellite information identifying 200 feet of a wooden object, 86 feet wide, extending over a crevasse, all of this being under 60 feet of ice and snow. The satellite information identified that 8 to 1300 feet below, fragments of the same structure were intact as well. And then in the fall line below that, the rest of the ark should be. Until a couple of hundred years ago, apparently the ark was intact, but in 1843, Mount Ararat blew out. A volcanic eruption expelled about one-sixth of the mountain, blowing some huge boulders as far as six miles away. And apparently the ark near the top rumbled down the side, broken at least two pieces at that point. A portion of it approximately 200 feet of it lodged, the rest of it careened down the side of the mountain, spilling out components, and then the larger portion fell into the Ahura Gorge that had been vacated by the volcanic eruption. Dr. Shockey found evidence that under 60 feet of ice and snow, there was a wooden vessel. Our satellites found that it was organic in nature. That would indicate that it was of wood. They monitored the site for us so that by the time we arrived in 1990, in the fall of 1990, and did 11 separate helicopter expeditions, the melt was down to 28 feet, and the end of an object was exposed. Under the auspices of the Creation Evidences Museum and Fiber, we leased a Russian-built Mi-8 helicopter, piloted by Yuri, who had flown Mr. Brezhnev and Mr. Gorbachev. The Creation Evidences Museum was the financial sponsor and co-academic sponsor of the project, along with Fiber. This helicopter was designed to fly at 10,000 feet maximally. We flew over 19,000 feet hovering over the mountain. We quite often flew 17,000 feet in the general vicinity of the Shockey site. We had to fly very rapidly. Otherwise, we couldn't remain airborne, and it is recommended that you remain airborne. As we flew, we could not focus in on specific areas very well, so we had to examine our photographic footage afterward. I want to show you what we photographed. This photograph was made by Robert Summers as we passed over the Shockey site, an undisclosed site on the north slope. I want you to notice a protrusion out over a crevasse. This is ice and snow melt that has covered much of that crevasse. I want you to notice there's an ice bridge extending out in this general configuration. Something is supporting that ice bridge. We have various angles of this and approximately 80 feet of whatever is supporting that, and this is the exact site that the satellite information showed that there was organic material in a construction under that. Approximately 80 feet extend out over that crevasse. If that were a rock formation, it could not remain intact. I want you to notice we have counted actually three openings of a window structure. 
We've identified a deck area. We've identified the blunt end. There's an icicle running over the edge of it. We've identified a slope structure built into whatever that is, and that certainly parallels the concept of the steps at the end. Now I'll show you another photograph. This photograph, until very recently, was classified. Remember, this is in the upper regions. Now 12 to 1300 feet below, various other fragments were picked up by the satellite. As we flew in that lower area, I personally saw a huge beam of laminated wood. By the way, the word gopher means to structurally interlaminate. I personally saw, looking out the helicopter window, a huge beam of laminated wood, approximately four feet thick, approximately 12 feet long, sticking diagonally out of the ice and snow. And that's consistent with what the satellite information found for us. Now, down in the gorge within the fall line, is this object. This photograph has been classified until recently. This is in the fall line above at the Shockey site. This is down in the gorge. Now, notice a broken portion. Notice a structure, a central structure in the middle which parallels the roof of the window system. Notice the sides paralleling this specifically. If you were to look extremely close, we can identify three layers or three stories within that broken structure. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on any video, you are privileged to see what we believe is a portion of Noah's Ark. We also believe a portion of Noah's Ark resides in this upper area. Noah's Ark really is there. Now, during the remainder of this video series, let's talk about a mechanism for the flood. Professor Emmy Clark, University of Illinois, has done a wonderful job in fluid dynamics. He has spent considerable time showing that the effect of the moon gravitationally on the earth on both sides of the earth facing the moon would create a tidal bulge and create tsunamis it would also bring the waters globally covered it would bring those waters into resonance and here's a graph showing those waters some at the lower levels and as resonance sets in waves of extreme heights and extreme proportions thus we have explained every 12 hours because of the tidal bulge on each side of the globe thus we have explained a new system of sedimentary deposits now Walter T Brown PhD did an excellent work in which he gave a scenario with the granite crust of the earth, with the interior of the earth, with subterranean waters being heated by a process that would rupture the earth into fountains and disturb the context of the earth with volcanic expulsion of muddy waters. Remember there was a scenario. That scenario is listed in the biblical record. And it states that in the 600th year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, three things happened. Number one, the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Number two, the windows of heaven were opened. Number three, it began to rain. And the rain lasted 40 days and 40 nights. And then fourthly, after 150 days, the waters from underneath the earth were assuaged. In our opinion, a disturbance inside this perfectly balanced structure of the globe, initiating a turbulence in the waters, would heat them up so rapidly and break the crust of the earth, expelling jets of this hot water. And Dr. Walter T. Brown has calculations to show expelling those 
thin jets 70 miles high. This canopy, this rakia, this bubble, was approximately 10 miles above the earth. So this very thin, just a few inches thick bubble of water would be ruptured and begin to collapse. The result, of course, would be a worldwide flood. And the question is asked, can waves reach those proportions we're talking about to actually ultimately destroy mankind and destroy all but what was in the ark in living systems on land that breathed? Well, tidal waves have been recorded in recent centuries with enormous catastrophic consequences. An earthquake in May of 1960 in Chile caused waves to speed 10,000 miles in 24 hours, 400 miles per hour. To do severe damage in Japan, California, Alaska, all the way to New Zealand. The Krakatoa volcano explosion caused waves of 125 feet across the ocean from Japan, Australia, India. At Cape Horn, waves were still 500 miles per hour. 36,000 people were killed worldwide. 6,000 ships were destroyed. Hundreds of villages in Indonesia were destroyed. All from one volcanic eruption. I'm simply stating that eruptions, volcanic within the surface of the globe, and eruptions in tidal wave tsunami proportions actually hold the potential for such violence. The flood was very, very rapid. Is there any recording in current scientific literature that would suggest it was genuine? Science News quoted Geology magazine in a work recently which stated that Permian shales and church in British Columbia show shifts in the carbon-13 and carbon-14 isotope ratios and decomposed plankton residue showing that they died suddenly in a few days or at most in a few months. How is this possible? The biblical record, the creation manual, states in Psalm 146 that the Creator uttered His voice and the earth melted. That's a context of catastrophic flood conditions, either the flood or the flood and the days or the experience of Peleg. The earth melted. Actually, we find that the internal structure has now decomposed and melted to such a degree that there's radioactive runaway. A few years ago, we thought it was 6,000 degrees at the core in the heart of the earth. Now we know it to be over 12,000 degrees, hotter than the surface of the sun. Leading manuals and scientific publications encourage us to accept the fact that the basic cause for the runaway subduction and the basic cause of the heating internally is radioactive runaway, a Chernobyl, if you please. And that exactly matches the creation model. In the 600th year of Noah's life, second month, 17th day of the month, three things happened. The fountains of the great deep were broken up. Envision the following. We do not know exactly how the Creator did it, but out of concern for His creation, realizing that violence filled the earth, there's a need to recharge and restructure mankind. Thus, we have the flood wiping out all but those inside the ark all of mankind except those who had the vision and the faith and the response to get in the ark. Imagine this, the earth is like an egg. I'm not suggesting that the earth <coughs> is organic in nature, but it's like an egg in a specific way. Here we have a secular publication showing that the Earth's surface is cracked like an eggshell. Inside the Earth, we have water and fluids. Inside an egg, we have water and fluids. We have solid mass inside an egg. There's an experiment I want to mention, but I want to ask you not to run this experiment. Take us, or at least 
recognize this experiment has been run. A single hen egg placed in a microwave oven. Now remember, the background radiation of the entire universe is microwave level. Apparently, that's the radiation factor that God uses extensively. So let's use that common denominator. Let's be scientific about this. Put an egg that has much in common with the earth inside a microwave. Push the button. Something very special happens. It's the water inside the egg that does the damage. That water envisioned here in a secular publication has the oxygen and the hydrogen. But it also has a dipole orientation. It has a negative and a positive. It has its own little magnetic field. The energy of that microwave is absorbed by the water and it begins to spin. The water molecule begins to jump around. There are billions of these in a very close contained area. Thus, they begin to jump around, they begin to heat up, and something has to give. Inside the earth, these were contained in a perfectly balanced structure. But when they began to heat up, something had to give. In an egg, something has to give. We've run actual experiments in which we placed an egg in an orientation. We knew the direction in which the energy would, be, would enter. We found that the egg cracked on the surface and there was a blowout at the opposite end where the energy entered. And it's all geometric, it all is proportional, it is a systematic result. Imagine the microwave energy entering somewhere in the Mesopotamian basin. Imagine, imagine the cracks being ruptured all over the globe. And in the South Pacific, imagine there being an upwelling now, geophysicists recently have found that there are two channels of surges of volcanic material and of radioactive material, two basic channels, an older and a younger channel. We identify the older channel with the initial activity of the flood and the latter channel with the activity in the days of Peleg. Walter T. Brown, Ph.D., found that if you disturb the waters so that you set off a chain reaction, it ruptures the earth into continental divisions. It does not separate those continents, but it ruptures the earth in a continental division. Let's illustrate on the chart over here. Ruptures the earth into continental divisions, sends jets of water 70 miles high. Remember that the canopy was 10 miles above the earth. So we have the canopy in the pre-flood world, we have the canopy here at the time of the flood. Three things happening. The fountains of the great deep breaking up because of the activity of the disturbance of the waters, generating extreme pressure and extreme heat. The fountains of the great deep broken, breaking up. The windows of heaven opening, literally rupturing channel windows wherever the rupture was, ripping the continents apart on Pangaea. You would have a subsequent rippage above the globe in the canopy, and it would cause the canopy to begin to collapse. Now that collapse at the poles would come in as ice. It would be moderated in the other parts of the world into water. So we have the raining 40 days and 40 nights. But the primary culprit is the expulsion of water from underneath the continents themselves. So it took 150 days for those waters to assuage. In the meantime, you have sedimentary deposits covering the entire globe. Now, the continents are ripped apart, but they're not separated. In the days of Peleg, there was another experience. A few hundred years after the flood, a man named Peleg lived, and in his lifetime, the earth divided. It's our opinion that the enlargement of the earth did not occur at the time of the flood, but with the channels already ripped into place from the first activity in the days of the flood, and with the runaway nuclear reaction being set up inside the globe, in the days of Peleg, the channels were already there. They introduced the opportunity for 
new channels to actually bulge the earth, very quickly shove entire plates upon other plates, creating ridges, mountain ridges in various parts of the world. This is envisioned here as an expulsion in the South Pacific, and this is the counterpart of that expulsion in the South Pacific. This is a wraparound showing a general flow to the magma, showing a consequent separation. I believe that the shoving of the continents together occurred very rapidly. After they were shoved, then there was a slow bulging effect covering essentially the lifetime of Peleg. Now there certainly is substantiation for this concept. Here we have in a secular publication, diatracks going up the vertical side of a rock mountain. Of course the dinosaur did not walk vertically up the sides of the rock. Those were flat, probably during the days of the flood, early days of the flood, the tracks were made. And then in a subsequent activity, a few hundred years later in the days of Peleg, those were shoved vertically as continents were shoved one upon another. A secular publication introduced this concept of India actually being shoved onto the Asian continent. And you have lines of influence and flow of uh, the plate tectonics involved. We call this the Peleg experience. In my opinion, this occurred early in the days of Peleg. There is further substantiation of the concept. In a recent Scientific American article, there is a schematic showing that during the mid-Cretaceous period, we had a tremendous bulge of activity from the internal structure of the earth. In the mid-Cretaceous period, that same article goes on to show that there was an upwelling in the South Pacific, that this was the area where the primary plume expanded, exp expanded itself, expelling huge magmatic portions and literally bulging the globe. All of this fits the creation model. And in the same article, an excellent set of data show the temperature rising at that time, the waters rising at that time, mountain building arising at that time, and magnetic reversals before and after that time, and then systematic reversals in recent times, geologically speaking. Well, what this means is there was activity in the days of the flood, there was activity later in the days of Peleg, two separate activities which can explain the initial rupture of the continents, the subsequent later Chernobyl runaway nuclear reactor meltdown internally that bulls the earth and in its initial activity jammed plates upon each other creating the great mountain ranges after the sedimentary deposits had already been laid down. It's quite significant for us to recognize that the eastern seaboard of the United States matches the sedimentary deposits of this area and this area. Three continents involved. So those continents were together when the sedimentary deposits were laid down, in our opinion, at the time of the flood. Now to reversals, magnetic field reversals. These were involved in the magma flow. The secular community says that about every 700,000 years, you have a magnetic reversal. Yet, new evidence indicates from Earth and planetary science letters that there's evidence for a very rapid reversal event on Earth taking locally, taking place in about 15 days, the time estimated for a pool of molten lava to cool. With that in mind, local reversals could occur on a global scale because of the expulsion of magma. That means that in only 15 days you could have an entire local reversal. Michael 
Arate, a scholar, has stated that lightning strokes can cause local magnetic field reversals. Thus, we do not have a global planetary reversal of magnetic field, but instead we have local reversals, and those did not take long periods of time. Let me wind this to a conclusion. I hope you're learning something. I'm certainly enjoying communicating, hopefully communicating this information to you. Our model, Creation and Symphony, shows that there was a mechanism in place called the firmament, the rakia. From the second day of creation, through each of the days of creation, and maintained in constant moment or energy all the way to the time of the flood. Energy was maintained by reception of shortwave cosmic radiation, received it, and recharged the field. That energy was used on the surface of the globe by living systems. There were local reversals at the time of the catastrophic flood, and at that time we lost the firmament, the canopy. At that time, we also lost the mechanism to keep the Earth's magnetic field charged. So it began to decay exponentially and quite rapidly. At the time of Peleg, there were more local reversals and a spreading of the Earth. That caused the field to continue to decay and it reached a relative low prior to the appearing of the Creator in flesh. Amazingly, Dr. Russell Humphreys reports that there, were, there was an influx at the time, at about the time of Christ. Magnetic field lines show a stronger moment or energy level. That's amazing. Then, of course, without a canopy to maintain it, it begins to deteriorate, is currently deteriorating. And this model uniquely satisfies not only the decay of the Earth's magnetic field, but it satisfies the question as to whether God originally designed the field to decay. In my opinion, the Creator did not design the field to decay, but instead designed the field to be maintained because of this firmament, which had to be crystalline in nature, to match the biblical record, also to match the constant energy requirement necessary for the Earth's structure and biological systems. Now, in the future, the creation model shows clearly that the Creator is concerned about His creation. He will return. Numerous periodicals have been issued recently showing that the earth is waiting for a Messiah. Christian and non-Christian alike are waiting for someone to return to lead us out of the chaos. In the creation model, there is a promise that the Creator will return, will restore that beatific design. Some theologians see a return in rapture and a tribulation period, then a millennial reign. Others see a buildup instead for a time of restoration. All see the eternal ages in which the earth will be remade, in which the heavens will again be in perfectly balanced relationship and righteousness will dwell throughout all the cosmos. It is my opinion that the mind of man, as earlier documentation has verified, influences even the distant stars to some degree. Theoretically, it has been stated that the flapping of the wings of a butterfly affect the weather on the opposite side of the globe. To what degree, we do not know. But it has been found that the slightest variation in the electron in one place has an effect on the vacuum, and the vacuum affects the entire cosmos. It's all interrelated. There will be a time in the future when this firmament will be restored, the lion and the lamb will lie down together, and ultimately, through the eternal ages, all will be restored in pristine glory to the honor of the Creator Himself. Let's conclude this series of studies 
with a reference. We've learned that evolution doesn't work. We've been given a model of creation to show that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, the light he called day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament. That firmament ultimately orchestrated beneficial life on the earth. Internal structure assisted in that. The planets and the constellations and the entire cosmos have a part. Evolutionist Dr. Eldred Corner, professor of botany at Cambridge, recently wrote, I still think that to the unprejudiced, the fossil record of plants is in favor of special creation. Did Jesus himself believe in creation or, as some well-meaning, Evolutionist, long-age theistic evolutionist would suggest Jesus did not really believe in creation. Jesus was the creator himself. Christ was the agency involved in the creation. As Dr. John Morris has indicated, Jesus believed in the creation. It was not a natural process. God himself did the creating, for he stated in Mark chapter 13, verse 19, from the beginning of the creation, which God created, Jesus speaking. He believed that the cosmos had a definite beginning, Matthew 24, 21, since the beginning of the world. He believed that the world was founded, John 17, 24, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. He believed that the sun was God's creation. Matthew 5, 45, he maketh his son to rise. He believed that each created kind was a different sort. Matthew 7, 16, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? He believed that God made provision for each kind in an orchestrated environment. Matthew 6, 26, behold the fowls, your father feedeth them. He believed that the Sabbath was a commemoration of a completed creation. Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man. He believed that man and woman were created at the beginning of the creation, not 4.6 billion years after the coalition of matter in the solar system. For in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, he said, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Christ is in all of the creation. Colossians 1.16 shows that the past work is that of creation, for by him were all things created. Colossians 1.17 shows that the present work is conservation, by him all things consist. Colossians 1.20 states that the future work of consummation will be that of Jesus Christ, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. It is my opinion and the specific thesis of the creation and symphony model that God did it right, that God is concerned about all his creation. And I trust that these considerations will lead you to appreciate the creator, to listen more closely to the song of the bird, the whisper of a child, and to know and worship your creator in person. We trust this venture has been a life-enriching journey. Hopefully, you will walk with the Creator as you enjoy His Creation in Symphony. For additional copies of Creation in Symphony or for Creation Resource Materials, contact Creation Evidences Museum, Post Office Box 309, Glen Rose, Texas, 76043, or call Area code 817-897-3200.